Greetings, beloveds. In the name of the Most High Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the one Yahweh, creator of heaven and earth, and in it and beyond it, and the paradox of all things of God lives on. Perhaps not with all the people who have answers, but here the questions live on. Free will versus predestiny. Someone told me that was a gray area the other day. And I am here to say, it's not a gray area, it's a paradoxical area given space and time. But given space and time do not exist, ultimately, then free will and destiny are one and the same because there is only one will, God's will, and that we will know when the time comes. All things are simply one. Free will and destiny The flaw in the concept is that it factors in time and space, present, past, and future, which is an arbitrary construct, a a, a part of creation. It is simply necessary for us to go through this. Though we like to think we have lives, though we like to think we have some purpose, though we like to think we have some... some, uh, And indeed we do. I mean, you you know, we're made, each one of us, unique for a special purpose. And uh, each one is special. Uh, it's not that we're not special, it's just that people in the context of God's creation being special tend to say, well, vanity, I'm special, you're not. And, you know, it's kind of a faux imitation of God. I am and you are not. So, it's all true. I am, and nothing else is. I am... And then actually the proper way to say it would be, I am, period, that's it. There's no more need to qualify anything. I am answers the entire question of the entire cosmos. I am is a a term called present, which I guess is some sort of present. I am is present. I am is now. I am is not later. I am is not the past. I am no, knows no time. I am uh, is eternal, but that just means no time. For we cannot answer what that is. And uh, the firmament we see is but a fiction. It's but an illusion. It's but a, a, a small sliver of a like Plato said, a reflection against the cave of light dancing on the cave, forming shadows and figures. And that's our view of reality. That's as good as it gets. Um, Or Paul, we look through a glass and darkly. That's, you know, that's about all we can see. It looks like a firmament. It looks like grass and trees and oceans and mountains. It looks like desert, sure does. It feels like desert. It sure does. I feel my bones are getting creaky as I age. They sure do. But as I was telling someone early in the morning, you know, I guess through a communicating with somebody through Yahweh through a distant phone channel, uh, in the end, we just unzip these suits and step out. After death is better than life on earth. You've heard the term, you've heard the term, he's gone to a better place. I shouldn't be sniffling while I'm trying to talk to you. You've heard the term, he's gone to a better place. Indeed, that's true. He has gone to a better place after death. He died, I envy him. No more struggle like we've got to do. You've heard that. How true is that? No more struggle. He's gone to a better place. He's gone to a place outside space and time. He's gone to be with the Lord, which means he's gone to the kingdom of God, which is dimensional, which is real, which is infinite, which means what? 
he's coming to full realization of what a human is and what it is not. He's gone to a better place and is in the process of creation, the fashioning of a soul, the fashioning of one to be the new Jerusalem or the pinnacle of creation. I think we better just go ahead and call the new Jerusalem the crowning pinnacle of God's creation. The, the ultimate goal of what this is now is really that. That's the finished work of God. It's the end of the discussion, the end of the whole thing. I mean, that's what you, that's where we're headed. It coded Mount Zion, the promised land. The Gnostics railed against matter and form. They railed against it. They thought, why would such an evil God create all this material form, you know, that just lives and dies and struggles and competes and suffers? And what kind of a cruel God is that, the Gnostics w would say, and the New Agers say, and whatever. My answer to you is, New Jerusalem, dude. You know, it's all part of a process. You might not like the process, and what you, what you think doesn't matter at all. All that matters is what the truth is. Your opinion, my opinion, anyone's opinion is irrelevant. Your opinion about the material world is irrelevant. So my suggestion to you is, instead of being such a sourpuss, just go ahead and Accept God's way because your way isn't. You have no way. It's either God's way or no way. And his way is Jesus Christ. In other words, he's going to lighteth it, and the Lamb is the light. And the Lamb is Christ. The Lamb is the Word. The Lamb is the Logos. The Lamb and the Father are one. The throne is one. It is in the center of creation. In the creation that God creates will be the throne of God and the Lamb that lights the world. There are no suns, no moons, no planets, no earth, no sea, nothing. There just is this, which is... I suppose it's hard for people to understand because they're all focused on the thousand-year reign and where they're going to be and all that. And I just say, bull, just, just knock that off the chart. That's not what's important. What's important, because even that is on the way to what? This. Full consciousness, full realization, full creation of God and man as one, not even man, God and, and his creation as one being fully conscious of him, God, and then fully conscious of his creation, the children, of which the throne of God, it, it sits in the midst thereof, which means in, within, which means the light emanates from within each body. There is no need for light or motion So that would kind of freak out the, uh, you know, the hybrids, the devil, the fallen angels, the angels, whatever, anybody who cherishes this form, this way of doing business. Anyone who cherishes this way of doing business is going to be SOL. They're going to be disappointed in God's creation. Hence, they probably won't be there. In the end, they will fail along the line somewhere. And that would have been meant to be anyway. There is no one who fails that is not meant to fail. If you fail, it's really not that much of a demerit on you because, in a sense, I, you know, I believe that people were made to succeed or fail from the very beginning. So if one does fail, which I wouldn't know, you wouldn't know, um then it's God's will, and that was, that was done for the purpose of this creation, and there is no failure ultimately with God. You know? There is no failure here. 
if one fails, if one succeeds, ultimately the whole concept we have of that is vanity anyway. Because there is no one that does this or one that does that or one that fails and one that succeeds and one that wins and one that loses. All that's moot. So perhaps you uh, God-haters, which you were meant to be, by the way, you were programmed to be that. So you're doing just exactly what your programming says. You create the dark to the light, create the opposite to create the friction and create the heat, create the movement, create the motion, create the momentum, create the creation, which is on the way to creation. Nothing in space and time is real. It's just simply a passing thing. Real means solid, eternal, unchanging, etc. So, the pinnacle of God's creation, the purpose of all this, is really ultimately answered in, you know, if what, the question posed in Genesis is at long last answered in the book of Revelation called the New Jerusalem, which remains a mystery to most people. And... Uh, And basically will remain a mystery because anyone who buys into the lie that this is it or that, you know, you're going to come back as something better than you were or that, that there is some purpose to all this that you can understand that has to do with you. See, that's all a lie. Even the idea of the purpose-driven church. Here we go. <laughs> I couldn't resist. Even the idea... Good thing I have some espresso because it's now 5 a.m. Even the idea of the purpose-driven church is in itself, in its very name, a great folly, a great sham upon the people to make them think that they have some purpose here while they're going off to a job or some purpose here while they're going off to their little lives. Little uh, meaning insignificant. Our lives and our endeavors, anything apart from God is insignificant. He wants us to be actors, though, on the stage. He wants us to go through our little lives. He wants us to believe it like there's a purpose, like, oh, I'm really going to Hollywood. It's really happening. I just stepped off the Greyhound bus, and here I am, you know? One of these days, I too am going to be a star. I'm thinking back to David Lynch's Mulholland Drive there. Don't stop believing. The old Journey song. Go take a look at Steve Perry down in Del Mar, California. Yeah, the bloom was off that rose. They had to hire somebody, other guy to be a, a crooner to imitate Perry. And, uh, it's a sad case because <laughs> as good as Journey's music was, and I do emphasize that in the past tense. As good as their music was, as good as Steve Perry emoted in his voice and created this, well, his greatest song is Don't Stop Believing." I think. People could argue that, but I mean, that really captured people's imagination. Like, you know, we're on this thing and it's very cinematic and each one of us has an arc, a journey. We each have a plight. We each have things to overcome and we're going to overcome those and we're going to, we're going to go for the gold and we're going to compete when we're young and we're going to try to get up there and win the Olympics or get that, you know, record contract or we're going to get that movie role or we're going to get that, you know, that good job or we're going to become lawyers or doctors and we're going to do something, you know, we're going to, we're going to set that world on fire. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Nothing but hope and, 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 and nothing but possibility and it's just wonderful. Except you forgot to factor in that we are frail at best. That things happen to people along the way. They lose limbs. They get ill. They get uh, competed with. They are unfairly slammed. They get broken in their souls. They get broken in their persons. They get abused and, and prostituted and, and uh, sold out and, and uh, put into slavery before they can even really before they can even really sing that song they wanted to sing. They gotta sing somebody else's song. Celebrate somebody else's success. 
get in line with everybody else with no chance, absolutely no chance of achieving any goal that would ever satisfy that original urge, that dream, that don't stop believing theme of youth. Oh, tragic, my friends. Yikes. Oh, how cruel. <laughs> how awful. How terrible. What kind of a evil God would, you know, put it right in your face and then snatch it away and say, you're never going to have that, bitch. What kind of a God does that? Eh, well, see, that was pretty unacceptable to me. You know, really unacceptable, and everyone called me a sourpuss. I sure did. The biggest criticism I got is I tried to do a video when I was in college, I remember, and it was like, you know, preparing to be like a broadcaster, <laughs> which, of course, is, a, is another oxymoron. And, uh, you know, all he could make, he made it into a personal attack where he just says, you know, you, you, you look like you're sour grapes. You need to kind of... You know, sour grapes, and well, what did I do? You know, I'm, uh, all I did is I noticed there was an elephant in the room, and now I'm sour grapes. Okay, because I could see you. So you must go out of your way, teacher, to criticize me, in other words, to lie about what you're really thinking, and to derail me from broadcasting, which you did, because something was fundamentally wrong with me being able to see what you've suppressed in order to get along. But I was just 18, 17, 18, whatever. Well, when I, sometimes these suppressed memories come back and really shock you, don't they? That was, I remember that. That was at, uh, in the university in the communications department or everyone had to do, you know, that in those days you didn't have a video camera, so... They had one in the in the Latin, the video in the classroom, and so you would uh, get your video taken. And I came across as being troubled, and his attitude was, "Well, why don't you get with the program, and then you know, just not be so like you are, and then just get with it like everybody else, and you too can have a life." Don't stop believing. Well, such was the way with me. I mean, I knew that one day, one day I would have the answer to that teacher because he made me feel like a freaking outcast. You know, I, I dropped out. I felt so embarrassed I dropped out because I, I didn't recall doing anything wrong. You know, and a similar thing happened when, uh, when I wrote a play in the theater for a theater class, and we're going to get the the actors who were in the theater in the, in college to read the play to do a dramatic reading. It was a one act, and it was a pretty good story, you know, as far as stories go. And uh, and he goes, you know, I can't really have the kids read this because, you know, your dialogue is terrible. It sounds like something out of the nineteen forties which, of course, was a weird kind of a compliment because that's what we were sort of going for. And um, so anyway, so that, you know, as if that answered it and that was like the gatekeeper saying, no, you will not have access because you're not exactly getting with the program. Uh, and it took me a long time to interpret that because I go back and read the play and go, hey, this isn't really that bad. I mean, this is pretty good. And it was a story about a, about a guy who, uh, uh, about a publisher who, uh, whose father was a publisher, and then he was the publisher, and then rediscovering an old writer that they had. And they wanted to, you know, suddenly his writings were becoming popular and they're putting out again. They had to go negotiate a contract with him. But in the absence of the father and the son's neglect, the writer went completely nuts. And he lived in a place in Los Angeles, like a little burned out studio apartment over a 
some some stores and graffiti, you know, that that kind of thing. And uh, they went to see him to kind of make a deal with him. And he started talking to the kid like he was the father. He was living back in that that pastime, yes, the 1940s. Hence the dialogue, dumbass. And, uh, you know, he was accusing the son of all the things the father had done to him. Stealing his money, not getting paid on time, having been left in the squalor, selling his, his books to the movies, everybody else getting rich but not him, having a hard life because of the father. He's talking to the son just like the father. And being a one-act play, you know, it wraps up after that. And then eventually, you know, the secretary says, look, I've, I've got him to come in. He's going to make a deal. Oh, good. We're going to get the... And then once again, they're going to steal the rights to that. You know, he's going to make a deal so we can syndicate those writings into all kinds of uh, short story books and all kinds of, you know, all kinds of avenues. You know, he's, he's sort of like a Van Gogh. We can, get, we, can, we can get famous off him, and even if he stays obscure. So he comes in, and uh, he's acting all, and he's going off on his craziness. And the next thing you know, they're going to have him thrown out of the building. He pulls a gun, and he shoots the son and kills him. And uh, vengeance was done. End of one act play. You know, it's one act. It's not like three acts. It's one act. Uh, I don't think that's so bad, do you? Uh, you got the themes in there, sins of the fathers visited upon the son, right? Um, the fact that this guy was unfairly treated and he went psycho. psycho. The fact that, you know, there was, a, there, there was a vengeance. The son paid for the sins of the father. You could call it the sins of the father, I, I, I suppose, as a one act play. And it had, you know, universal human themes in it. If I were the theater teacher, I would have uh, given it at least a B. And, and, and the dialogue was, yeah, the, the, the main character, the, the writer's dialogue, he spoke like, you know, back in the 40s when he had his success. But the son and the secretary and everybody else was modern. Um... So I had some talent. Well, what happened is the door was shut in my face right then and there. And I just, I felt so humiliated. I never wrote again. I mean, until a lot later. But a decade went by before I'd ever attempt to touch it again. Because I was so ashamed of myself. Because I feel I, I, I so utterly failed. Turned out, I didn't fail at all. I just told you the story. Without embellishing it, by the way. That's basically the, the bare bones structure of the story. So I lived to tell about it and prove just now that it was a, a good story. Um, and I guess I suppose the lesson in this is when they try to do this kind of stuff to you, don't listen, just keep going. Because they're going to try to derail you. I don't care who you are. That's all part of the process of having your dreams and your hopes and desires chiseled away from you one chisel at a time. This life is death by a thousand cuts. There is no other way to put it. The Satanists believe they can t cut across, take a shortcut, butt in in line, and they have it easier than you, but no, in the long run, they have it much harder. I've watched them die, I know. It's, it's horrifying to watch them. They call it Alzheimer's and all kinds of things, but it's Satanism. You know it and I know it. We're not going to have those problems. It's Satanism, seriously. It's, if that causes the disease, fine. It's that they just can't handle the guilt as it comes back, so they start forgetting. Because it's, you know, it's lying and murder. You know, other guys die so you can have your little life. Your, your, oh, you're much more well-deserved life than that guy over there. Your children can eat while they starve. You've decided to bite the apple, so there you go. There you go. Everybody is, in, is, you know, has to stop for you because you're the important one now. And when someone comes out, they just like go through a, a, like a month-long partying of everyone trying to be their friend and then eventually they're shown the back of the line and shown what they got to do to compete. How low you go determines how far you go. 
All right. So there was a lot of kids back in school that had felt like they were the first ones to ever discover this new shortcut. <laughs> and boy, did they make sure everybody knew that they deserved a good ass kissing whenever they walked down the hall, that they were a made man already. The world was their oyster. Everyone ought to get in line and serve them because they were there earlier than you. Therefore, they deserve it all. The adults simply get angry. What's wrong with these kids? They all have to fall in line. There's some of them still individuals out there. We're going to break them. And indeed, school is for the purpose of conforming the next group of sellouts and punishing, culling, finding the holdouts, the pure hearts, those who can't see the Satan shortcut, and making sure they suffer or become a sacrifice for the benefit of those who got with the program, those who disgustingly sold their souls and became perverts, liars, cheats, and murderers, and those who are now lifted up to the very top as the President of the United States, the King of the world, due to that kind of lifestyle. And you wonder what, why things are screwed up? <laughs> I mean, you know, I say President of the United States, and what I mean by that is everybody in position of power. So that's the world. And if you like, you can just go back to the metaphor of, you know, rather than putting in the context of the ac actually 100% true spiritual battle that I just outlined, which there was not one false word spoken, and no one can argue it, not one because it's like arguing that there's a sky, or not, or earth, or not, or a moon, or not. It's on that level, so it can't be argued with. There is no opinion here. That's, that's, this is beyond Plato. Absolute fact and clarity. That's the way it is. There's never been any deviation from that. That indeed has been the, the, the tough one. And... The devil offers the shortcut, which is really a curse in the long run that perpetuates the curse of humanity and perpetuates the prison because these people, these geniuses who discovered that shortcut, they have to sell out all of humanity and cause everyone to suffer for their own boy better than everybody else way of life. And they know it. And it's, it's systemic. It's not based on the individual. It's, it's a collective. It's a systemic thing. But each one who's a honcho, they're there not to help, you know, progress things and bring people up in the classes or anything like that. They're there to punish everyone beneath them and force them into labor that's unfruitful, which is why you have the labor movement, right? Labor that's unfruitful and unfair. Um, and these managers are uh, going to lord it over them. It's not really about how good a manager they are. They're going to get their result. It's about punishing labor. So that's why you have reactions. Labor's not going to sit there and go, you know, you're, this big corporation's a big tick getting bigger and bigger and I'm getting poorer and poorer. It's not going to stand. So they react. Yeah, a lot of labor... Hey, I'm making a class division here. A lot of labor did not take that shortcut. So, you know, there you go. It's the smart guys. All right? So, hence, we have the world war that's going on constantly. But let's keep an uh, abstract perspective. And let's look at it this way. So, each person, whether you are the manager or whether you are the laborer, you are chipped away at, or whether you're the innocent student like I was, just thinking I just got off the bus and, you know, there's hope for me and maybe I can find a place as a writer or a, uh, or a, a drummer or, a, you know, there's something for me out there. And then I was told, no, there is not. No, there is not. And hence the beginning of the chiseling of the death by a thousand cuts that, you know, first they take your dream away. They take your success away. Oh, 
you know, you can have high school victories, I suppose, and college victories. But, I mean, eventually you find out that you're not going to be the thing that you dreamt of. You're not going to keep on believing because it's been stripped away from you bit by bit. Let's say you go into the military. You come back without a limb. Nobody wants to hire you. They treat you like dirt. You, you had hopes and dreams, too. When you got back in the States... Things were going to be different. And then it's chipped and chipped and chipped. I don't care who you are. Don't stop believing. It's for suckers. Go look at a picture of Steve Perry living in Del Mar, California right now. You know, he's not the youthful. ah, Nature was pretty hard. It was hard on all of us. But I mean, that whole thing, that whole singing that song has gone. He's not believing. He's like a lot of us. He's just trying to survive here, trying to have a decent life trying to trying to make sense of it so we can get through another day and not you know be in sorrow and pain and depression and and self-loathing and hatred and and just feeling so bad so bad and then sinning maybe as a result and then you know a vicious cycle that you know god must have forsaken us you know so bad but earlier in our youth we all you know when we're graduating you know the world was going to be our oyster we're going to we're going to, you know, one's going to be a rocket scientist, and other one's going to be a, I don't know, Bill Gates. <laughs> I guess he got his dream. But, you know, people that know who he is, well, I remember him from high school. I just remember this one incident. He was a year ahead of me, a year, one year above me. But I do remember he was hazed, you know, back when it was a military school at Harvard there in Studio City. And uh, I often thought that, you know, that day that I remember vaguely too, it's not a real strong memory and I I could be inaccurate, but I think it was, I think it was Gates that got Hayes one day and they did it to everybody, you know what I mean? But he was like, they pick on the nerds, you know? So he was like a nerd and I think he got picked on. I I keep thinking that his eugenics program is, uh, his global population work I keep thinking it's all going back to that day I think it was a Thursday because on Thursday we had we had a pass and review or something you know with the military eventually the the libtards came in and overthrew the military and then they went to kind of a now they're like this whole gay they they merged with a girls school and it's like this whole gay thing Jason Collins went there I dropped out of 10th grade after 10th grade I was uh but I was there from 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th. So I was there for four years. Anyway, Gates, I keep thinking that Gates was just getting, and we all call them Gates, but I keep thinking that Gates was just getting even for the treatment that he received at Harvard. I just keep thinking that might have been it. It might have been some traumatizing thing that happened. And by God, he was going to get even with those people, you know? And he, and boy, he sure did. But um, he, he, I, I suppose there's always a guy like that that exceeds all expectations or like Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones are still out touring. But at some point, the Reaper comes for these guys too. In other words, they're not able to be their own gods. They can't control life after death even though they're working very, very hard with technology to try to clone themselves or do something where they live on consciously as themselves without losing memory. Um, this is the quest and the dream and the hope. And I'm here to tell you that, that a lot of the aliens you see started out as humans. <laughs> and um, they wound up being not at all who they were. Most people that even get to the point of playing with those kind of toys, which are, you know, hundreds of years in advance of our technology. Um, by the time they get there, they aren't who they began. You know, Gates today isn't like the guy that I, I know. I am but I've been told that I'm like the, the same guy they knew. So I didn't really, I have the same soul. I'm not accusing him of anything. I don't know. You know, I don't know. He just seems different to me than I remember. And uh, uh, I noticed he's also one of the big donors there. So he, he does feel he had a good experience in this school. But anyway, the point is we're chipped down and chipped and chipped and chipped. 
and, and cut and cut and cut and compromise and compromise and compromise until finally we'll just about settle for anything. And we just ask them, please don't hurt me as we get older. Please don't let me die. Please don't hurt me anymore. I already gave up my hopes. I already gave up my dreams. I already quit everything. I already realized that I was, I was just so wrong to think I could ever be somebody or do something. I'm so sorry that I ever thought to strive because you've taught me through punishment exactly where I, bl- I stand in life and exactly what my position is in life. I'm so sorry to think that I was something else or you know, that I considered myself to be this or that when in actuality I wasn't any of those things. I was nothing because you have determined what my outcome is. I was nothing. You know, though I wrote I was not a writer because I was not, you know, made one by the writing thing. They, they make you one, I'm, or made a producer, or made a this. Or ma- they didn't make me one, so therefore I don't exist because of them and me not being on the same page. Therefore, I am so, 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 so very sorry I ever breathed air. I mean, I should have asked your permission, and along with your permission to be somebody or be something, you, you who determine all of our lives, that unless we bow down to you, we don't actually even exist. Had enough. That is the world 101, and there's no way to argue that. would be like arguing there is no earth, arguing there is no moon. It's just basically I just stated the, the way it is for every single human being upon the earth. So if you choose to go your own way, you don't exist. If you go their way, you still don't exist because who you were, your soul is scalped. It's taken out of your body. You are now part of the hive, so you don't exist. You're not who you were. You're not who you were to enjoy your rock stardom. Oh, yeah, the devil will give you all kind of music riffs and make you look like a genius, but it's really glorifying him, not you. You don't exist either way. So that's the sad, yes, it's a very sad life. It's very sad that these young hopefuls never get a chance. And yet in their face are thrown the succeeders in society thrown as paradigms that they can never achieve, thrown in their face, rubbing their nose in it. This is what you got to be. This is the brass ring. Don't stop believing. Here's what it is. So a lifetime of putting their noses to the grindstone and getting nothing. Oh, all the lonely people, where do they all come from? (laughs) And I'm here to quash it all and say... Oh, all the lonely people, the question is irrelevant completely and idiot, idiotic to even propose such a question. The answer is all the people are in the same exact boat no matter what side of the dumb equation they choose, light versus dark. All in the end and death are equal, period. Well, some, you know, I guess some are, some are, you know, not there to die because they're gone when they're in their youth, they're taken out and they put another soul in that one. But that's uh, the aliens that do that. We call them the aliens. They're really the ancient humans, but that's okay. They're not aliens at all. They've been here longer than we have. So, but they run the soul scalping business. Uh, They're, yeah, they're connected with the military industrial complex and everything. It's all, it's all a very conscious thing. You, my friend, let me just answer the whole question. We are therefore here as a gene pool and as cattle and as a soul pool, as a soul pool. And basically they, they harvest us as they will. And that's why you see this story abrogated, this story violated, this story isn't true, don't stop believing. You can just believe in yourself and be anything you want. No, you cannot. And you do not. And you prove me right every day. Things happen to people. We are here in a prison at their behest. They, the ones you don't see, who are, who are uh, husbanding you, 
culling you, modifying you, shaping you, using you for their bidding while you think you've got either A over here the shortcut or B over there the loser. Doesn't matter. In the end, you're all still cattle. So maybe you Satanist shortcutters ought to give that, give that a whirl, see what that does for you. I, well, nothing else works, so I guess, you know, you can just keep on believing you're, you're something. I got news for you all. The ones who were told they were something are nothing. The ones who were told they are nothing are not nothing. It's reversed. The ones who took the shortcut are nothing. The ones who got shunned and um, put outside the gate are something. In the long run. Uh, perhaps you didn't get to be the big breadwinner. Or, you, know, you were seen as some derelict. or You've suffered greatly because you really had the best intentions, didn't you? You just really wanted to, you know, make a difference in the world and be successful and work hard. And, and, and they said, no, you, you can't. Because, see, they're in the business of harvesting souls. Friends, listen, they can't harvest your soul unless you give in and become somebody. They reward you because they know they're going to get your soul to use. Otherwise, they would not reward you. So you who die with your souls intact, uh, no matter what side of the equation you fall in on your belief in God or not, at least you're intact soul-wise. You still have a chance. You see, they give the rewards of, oh, you're somebody. Oh, here's your award. They give those things to people that give something to them that they want, that they can have that they need desperately to further, what? A race of machines. I, I, I know, it just sounds wild, but that's ultimately what it is. Which is not just a machine. It has, you know, there's the use of souls, of DNA, of, you know, the physical world. In fact, this entire physical world is used for minerals, plant genome DNA, you know, animals, uh, humans. All of it's a farm for them. And the people that are in power do their bidding against you. Yes, like Obama, for example. I mean, it could be anybody, but just he's the greatest example because he's so easy to read, you know, that he's, he's so vindictive and mean that you can see it so clearly in his, you know, speeches and whatnot when he's, you know, that he's there to punish people. You know, he likes it. But anyway... Um, yeah, you know, a lot of dictators like that too. But here's the thing. Uh, so he, uh, he's paid, put there by these, quote, aliens, unquote, because he is like the Nazi that would help, like the, the Jews who would help the Nazis, and they get a, they, they're going to live for like three more days. So they, they're helping the Nazis get these Jews into the ovens. And, you know, get them into the gas chambers and then into the ovens. And as a reward, they get, like, they get steak, they get wine, they get bread. They get to kind of live it up. They get to dine with the Nazis. You know what I mean? They get to dine at a table with, with, with linen and stuff. While they're, you know, gassing those Jews, their fellow brethren. The minute the gassing is done, the um, commandant and his, and his men go up and down the rows... And they find these guys who uh, basically had helped them and they had given them steak and everything else because they were making sure those Jews are getting gassed. And they shoot them all in the head. They live exactly one day or half a day longer than their Jewish brethren that they slaughtered for Hitler. That is exactly what Obama is. Okay? He's doing their bidding against you and being a traitor to humanity against you because, it, because he has a lust that they give him power. But the minute the job is done, he's gone. He's gone. I mean, it may not, he may be gone now. I'm just saying that that's the structure. Uh, that's the way it is. There was a movie, gosh, I can't remember the name of the movie now. They showed that exact 
thing that I just said. Like, it, it's a principle in life. Uh, if you help the enemy, you get to be somebody. But you've already put a, a, a knife in the heart of humanity in order to get your pop, in order to get your run around the track, in order to get your gold medal, in order to get your position, in order to get your presidency in the United States. You've had to turn on, not, not just the country, but you have to actually put a, a knife in the heart of humanity in exchange for your, oh, so above it all status. You see, you see what's hard there? And then, of course, punishing your enemies is a way to keep the power alive, you know. It's, so I just envision Obama being in the White House just sort of like holed up in a, in a little room with the IRS guy who visited 5,000 times, you know. You know, that guy in the Tea Party, you've got to get him. And, and just creating a big list every day and obsessing on people that are conservative or believe in God or, the, you know, the enemy. And he's just like did, completely possessed with this idea of getting these people rather than running the country, rather than dealing with international affairs, rather than dealing with the, uh, the financial crisis. No, he's in there like Nixon going after like these reporters at Fox News and getting, and I believe that he orchestrated the whole thing. His presidency has become one of his own obsessive pettiness as a failed human being. And no, don't worry, Bush was just, just pretty much not different. Clinton was no different. I mean, we're, we have a, a whole host of um, lousy people, undeserving people, who because of their being traitors to you and humanity, got their position, their pop, their place. Because had they not done that, they wouldn't be anybody. So the next time you're going to berate yourself for not being somebody, think about that. In God's eyes, you are already wonderful because you know what he calls you? I feel like the Wizard of Oz now, you know. <laughs> when he's talking to them, they say, I need a heart, I need a, you know, and, he, and he's kind of complimenting them. But you know what God calls you? Jesus calls you, he calls you an overcomer. You, you've taken all this crap. You've, you've gone through the abuse. You've, you've, you've toughed out. You kept the faith the whole time, a lot of you. You know, you kept struggling through, you know, kept having to work on forgiving everybody for hurting you and going back to the Lord for redress and saying, Lord, why, are the, why is this so hard, Lord? Why, Lord? Why, 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 Lord, 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 please help me. But you stayed the course. You know, despite how much gaping wound pain you were in. Pain because of other people who took the shortcut. Mind you, your pain only comes from there because your dreams and hopes when you were born and what you thought when you were a child and as you were impressionable and you saw maybe you wanted to be a fireman, a lot of kids did when they were like five and six, you know, things like that. Those are all robbed from you, robbed from everybody. And you're given this choice. You either agree to become cattle. So this is why I laugh when I see six successful people. I start laughing. I'm like, oh, yeah, you just, okay, well, you really, I mean, you're just beyond everybody. You're so deserving. I can't bow low enough. <laughs> and really, my respect, if you like, goes to those losers who are winners with God because they're intact. I mean, it's, an, it's a miracle. They've shown the greatest strength and the greatest fortitude and the greatest endurance of anybody. And to be eventually, you get used to being non-acknowledged. You crave it. You love it. You do some great, like me, it's gotten even more fun. You do some great work, you know, knowing that no one, ever, not even your own people, will acknowledge it. Just like it's a rule. I, you don't exist. I've even gone into places and just waved my hands in their face, and, and indeed, I was invisible at times. Literally. And then there's all kinds of supernatural properties that go along with people like me that the, the, the worlders don't have at all, any way, shape, or form, not even close. Not, not even the same species anymore. God's good to his people. 
And, you know, this divide between light and dark, good and bad, humanity that's chosen the shortcut, which, of course, every generation thinks they're the ones who discovered it, are wrong. And everything they do is a lie. And everything they do is wrong. And then they die and the next generation comes in. But I'm trying to give you a perspective as to what it all really means to step back from the personalizing of it now. Because who can, but look, overcoming means, like with me, I've seen it, I went through it, I came out the other side of it, that is, on God's side of it, I came out that side of it, but I mean, I, or stayed on our side, or whatever you want to call it. I went through the insanity, and it was insane trying to grok this in my mind. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. And then, of course, all the Satanists, and they're all doing rituals and killing people and buggering children and doing all this mind control and, and hive mind stuff, and, it's, and demons are walking around in people, and whoa, there's that too, you know? The aliens and their ships were always around the rituals going on, and, you know. Yeah, there's that too. I mean, then it, it's really spooky and weird. But uh, the bottom line in the end of the day is, um, you know, the Lord is good to his people. He pulls them through. The bottom line at the end of the day is, Humanity is basically a farm of farm animals. That's basically what humanity is. And, you know, the thing they can't understand is those people of the Lord, those people of prayer, and all of whom are losers, of course, and those people of prayer. When they pray, they get upset. They, they, that prayer might do something that really scares them. And it's like they think if those Christians or those God people or those Yahweh people or those wherever they are, if they ever find out how much power they really have, we're done. So you're more than you think you are. You like me. I'm sorry, I almost lost this thread, and I'm not going to. Um, I, so I went through the insanity, kind of came out the other end of it, came back into the world, you know. And God gave me the strength to forgive it all. And to like, you know, now I sort of, you know, when you run into them thinking they're so smart, you start laughing. You know, you just start, you, you can't help it. But you keep a cheery disposition. You know, you, you don't blame a child for being childish, even if they're 25. You don't blame them for being so childish and thinking they're above you. Or even better, they're trying to instruct you on maybe you can have a good last few years. And you're thinking... I'm here as the basically symbolizing about the only hope you have, dude. And I mean, your last chance. And you're sitting here trying to tell me about um, the guy who's been torturing me my whole life. Come on. You think I would ever jump into bed with someone that murders other people? That makes you who jump in there a murderer, a liar, a thief, and a pervert? Meaning you get off on dismemberment. You get off on tragedy. You get off on drone strikes. That's what these people, that's where they wind up. Everyone on the path you're on winds up at the same place. For you, death is your only hope and a gift. Because if you live long enough, you're going to pay for every last thing you did. Usually, like I say, it's, they call it Alzheimer's, but that's not what it is. I mean, that may be the thing that finally, you know, they can measure that. But, I mean, these kinds of issues to older people, you know, the need to forget, the need to just be gone, is because they can't handle the guilt when the guilt comes. See, the consciences are seared when you're a kid and you take the shortcut. But later on, that conscience comes back. And when it does, all these people want to do is die or escape or in the case of some, I've seen them double down on the game, but, you know, time's running out and then they die. Um, any of you out there who are conscious got to understand. Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yahweh, the one, the way, John 17, is, uh, now let me read this. Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, and thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. 
And this is the life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou hast gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. But for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, Keep me through thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should get, shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them th through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. And for they, their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might also be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom you hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name. And I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Equals New Jerusalem. Equals the true creation of God. Equals the mystery of Christ. Equals the purpose of creation. Equals the entire enchilada. I in them, and them in me. I in them, them in me, them in thou, as one that they may be where I am. I send them into the world, though the world has hated them, because they're not of the world. Yet I send them into the world. They are in it and not of it, of course. This is their position from birth. The father never loses one, so these people are just the way they are from birth. The world doesn't know what to do with them. The distribution is already preordained before even the world was formed. So... The people that belong to God always did, always will. And the people that don't, don't. Why they're both here, I don't know. I don't know. It's got something to do, though, with 
the final creation of God, which is the New Jerusalem, somehow out of these opposites, with God, not with God, you know, of humanity. Uh, you know, destructive force in the world, creative force in the world, you know. Volcano creating more land masses, earthquakes destroying that which was there. I just don't, you know, it's just, that's the way it is. You know, not trying to personalize it. I'm simply saying that those of you that did not take that shortcut, which of course is because you weren't um, made to. It's not, that's not part of your consciousness. So it doesn't occur to you. Um, They may call you derelict, but that's not it. You were made to be who you are so that, you know, God can have his will done. And, you know, your reward is with Jesus. No worries. Your reward for overcoming of going through this ordeal is, you know, you're, you're kind of like a woman in travail before birth, and that's how it's been your whole life. They, on the other hand, aren't giving birth to anything. They're not, they're already important in their own limited jobs and lives and little things they do, and kings and queens and presidents and fools, and they're basically going to run around the track, and then that's it. Feeling, oh, so self-important. There is a purpose in your suffering, you know. To be in Christ is to suffer, But to be in Christ, as a lot of people understand, I have a certain understanding about Jesus, that there is no free will, ultimately. Those who are his are his, and and he says it in John 17. I mean, we have free will, but, you know, in other words, God made us to choose what we choose. So, so, you know, it's a moot point. The point is, there is, uh, you know, if you belong to him, everybody knows it, even by the time you're about 10 years old. They all know who you belong to. You know, they start in with the psychiatrist. <laughs> but, but they know who you belong to. Um, the world keeps tabs. And uh, reward for those people that stab humanity in the back or in the heart or whatever. And punishment for those that are in it, not of it. Uh, because the world is a farm. And they're harvesting souls. And, you know, the ones that don't give them their souls are, are tending, you know, are not going to be somebody. <laughs> the fools! Somebody. Yeah, see his plaques on the wall there. He's a legend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, you could be uh, with God and be a, have a plaque on the wall. Sure. Now, I don't want to make a rule like... There's no plaque on the wall. No, it's not. It's not. It's a. It's a mixed bag to a certain extent. I'm just saying, cutting through to the general rule. To the, I just want you to know it's a farm. Okay. That's the point. Whether it's fair, it's, it's not. Of course, it's not fair. It's got nothing to do with you, or with man, or man's laws. You see them breaking the law every day on Capitol Hill, right? It doesn't matter. There are no consequences because those laws are irrelevant. That proves. My point, there are no consequences. When you are one of theirs, the, the only law is do the bidding of that, of the, you know, dance with the one who brung you, which is what they're doing. And they're told there'll be no consequences, which there aren't. No matter how much evidence amasses, oh, there may be in the end, just to make sure people don't get onto this general principle. At some point, the Lord says the wicked pay. The wicked are those who are obviously not of God. Which would be them, because they're the ones who are putting forth no prayer in the schools, the Antichrist agenda, pushing the Muslims to persecute women and Christians and gays, by the way. You gays out there that are going with the Muslim thing because you think it's, it's a left-wing cause and you just want to do everything left uh, because the left was good to you. Uh, wait till they start lopping your heads off. You know, if, if, I mean, if it ever, if it goes that far, I, I don't know. But I mean, they've been known to do that to people or to punish them in some way for being gay or for being a woman. You know, I'm, I'm just stating what I've seen. I'm not trying to be pejorative or mean to the Muslims. I'm not just saying that, yes, I do notice this double standard. But then again, when I look at the farm and I look at the aliens, I look at the 
the structure of the military industrial complex. And I see that the laws are there. Television, it's just basically a fiction. And it's really not ever going to, um, you know, be fair or normal. Uh, but just realize that the people that are in power punishing conservatives, really it's Christians, just understand that where, what, you know, where they wind up. And not all of them are actually belong there. Some are prodigal sons and daughters. So, but at the same time, it's not really about us. It, it, the bigger picture is it's a farm that's being harvested. And the people that are running it hope that the people of Yahweh never wake up and realize that because then they'd be in trouble. Because you don't know actually these people that I'm talking about who are in it, not of it. Just as it was described in John 17, I mean, that did it in a way that I, it, I think it made more sense now that I, you, you had my speaking for a while. It made more sense than going into that chapter. Now, after this discussion, it makes a lot of sense. You see, you are somebody in the beloved. You are beloved, beloved. <laughs> you are loved, beloved. You are important, beloved. You are somebody definitely in Christ. Somebody wonderful. Someone in the, in, the, in, the, in the process of creation. Someone in the process of becoming glorified at some point. You know, uh, to be made the best that you can possibly be. The new Jerusalem. And that's the pinnacle of God's creation. That's the end of the story right there. The story is about the perfection of God's creation of man and his, and his perfection as in the image of God, as the pinnacle of the creation of God, at least that's what the Bible says. That, that not the firmament, not the stars and the planets, not the animals, not the birds and the trees, but human. And I know you're going, oh, God, I'm so awful. How could I ever? Well, no, it's really not up to you. You'll be, you'll be transformed into that, whether you like it or not. So, but that is really what made the angels jealous and what made many of them rebel because they were not to be part of that perfection or so they thought or so the myth goes. So um, that's it. I mean, you know, you... To even put it in a more easy to understand context, you were not an ugly duckling. You know, they shunned you because they didn't understand because you were different. You were a swan. So when you're kids and you have all that hope and dreams, the ugly duckling had all the hope and the dreams. You know, but was barred because he was different, not allowed to to compete, not allowed to participate. He had to be shunned over there and over there and over there. Cut out and cut out until finally he was just sorrowful. Until one day he realized, saw the swans and how awesome they were and realized that's what he was, a swan, not a duck at all. And when he got together with the swans and flying with the swans and living with the swans, he was just as happy as could be. He was somebody, he was home, he was beloved, he was at rest at long last. That's how it is in Christ. The minute that I really understood that, I forgave it all. I mean, all those little incidents and all those anecdotes that I shared with you about being shunned for being a good writer. Oh, yes, if you're good at something, they shun you for that. They, you're supposed to do it our way, you know. But your way, I wouldn't exist. <laughs> but, but, you know, of course. But you understand that, don't you? Um, now, most of them, no, most of them do not understand it. Most of these people do not know they took a shortcut or that they serve the devil or they put a knife in the heart of humanity. They just, you just see them getting more and more evil in their lives. And you see, well, obviously, you know, we see who they serve. They serve darkness and evil. It's like, yeah, but they appear as angels of light. That's a supernatural gift that they have. Yes. So, so at the end of this little charade here, this, this what, 50, 80, 90, 100 year, whatever it is, a joke at best, they're gone. 
They, they are as if they never were in the first place. They've done their bit and they're gone. You're just beginning. So I'm just trying to show you to stop complaining, please, and start counting your blessings, please. You're not one of them. You, you, look, swans and ducks are two different species. There is a species difference here. And that's another good way of putting it because that is a literal truth. Even if it hasn't yet been measured in the laboratory, it will be one day. But there are two different species that are, you know, intermingled together. Um, those that hear the world's voice when they're young children, they hear the world calling. Those who hear God's voice are, at young age, they hear God calling. And the division occurs right there. And the outcome occurs right there. Those of the world tend to do well in the world. Those of the Lord tend to be the ones who have to struggle and overcome. Okay, that's just the way it is. But quit complaining about it because ultimately your position is far superior to that which is dying. You're not dying. I mean, you need faith to understand all this, to understand that where you're going is, is unbelievable and that they're not going where you're going. There's a they and us and a them and they're just the way it is. It's just... The way God made it. Uh, they all believe that deep down inside we're all the same. Not true. Deep down inside we are not all the same. And that irks them to no end. And they get even more mad at God when they understand. When they understand fully. They get even madder. And eventually that can lead to putting Christians to death. Throwing them to life. They get so mad that they just... Start killing innocent people just because if they're, you know, they're what they are, they don't like. They don't. Like. If they weren't an out-of-species difference, there wouldn't have been the persecution throughout the past. Why would they be persecuted? It's not what they do. It's who they are that the reason. That because a person, I know a lot of Christian people that tend to work and blend in and go along to get along. They're not too fervent as. I mean, they are still real, but they're not really. Wearing it on their sleeve, they're not praying in the workplace, they're not doing anything. But still, there's that hatred. They're nice to everybody, despite all the negativity coming back on them. They try, a good, do a good job, and they're content that they get passed over at work for promotions, and they tend to take it with a, with a smile and a, in good regard for their fellow man or whatever. But at the end of the day, there's something very wrong here. Something very wrong. At the end of the day, there is something very wrong. And uh, I'm telling you, it, it, well, it's not wrong. It just is a, it's, it's a systematic thing that is implacable and it's always been this way and always will be. Can a person that's an ugly duckling or a swan decide to be a duck? No. It's not possible for him to be a duck. God does not lose any who are his, therefore. Okay? It's, in other words, if you've been told you're a failure, it's not your fault at all. Remember, you worked just as hard as the other guy, just as even better. And he went, you didn't. Remember that? Oh, I know a lot of you in that category. You who had more talent, and yet the other guy went, See, it's all a test for you. The ducklings, furthermore, to, to, to confound this myth and even torture it more, these ducklings, the ducks, don't actually exist. Because if it's not an eternity, it doesn't exist. So it's part of this illusion. And um, as far as what I told you today, they don't think that far. They're not allowed to. If they start thinking like that, there's a little machine that comes and pulls them out of line and bitch slaps them a little bit, you know, and then sticks them back. You know, they're like robots. They're not real. Uh, I had friends that would use a, they take a, like a laser, you know, those pocket laser pens, and they take it wherever they go to see the, because there's holograms out there too. So they take them to sh see if, how many holograms there are in a crowd, you know. And if the light goes through them, then they know, ah, see, there's another one. That was pretty funny. 
that they would actually take a laser light to, to, to prove this, this bizarre situation we're in. Well, yes, there's hybrids, there are machines, there's hologram, and most of the machines are holographs. And, um, you know, they have a certain solidity and a certain, but they're not really there, as you like to think. What you see, your eyes deceive you. What, you're not really seeing reality when you wake up and you walk down the street and you go to your job. That's completely a fabrication. You're on the Truman Show. That goes for everybody. Now, that is true for everybody. Uh, nobody believes more in this reality here than um, those who, you know, took the bait. But really, it's not the bait they took. All that happened to them is DNA, if you want to look at it scientifically, DNA was triggered. It took over, and they became one of them. It wasn't like... They had to come up and summon courage so they could go ahead and do something evil in order to get something good. None of that existed. It's just a, it's just a triggering of something that comes up in a person or that takes over the consciousness and they naturally fit wherever it is they go. It's very simple. It's very simple. I think people and poets and thinkers and philosophers and Theologians and various people have conf confused it all because they keep embracing this paradigm that humans are all the same, that if they would all just choose this or that, they would be okay. And humans are not all the same. They're not even all human. So, <laughs> you know, and that can't be proven scientifically, obviously. So they're stuck with this idea that they think they're looking at a, like a monolith of humanity, like it's like a one thing. And in that premise, their sciences, their philosophies, their theologies, their interpretations of the Bible, for example, all fail from the very beginning. From Adam and Eve through to the New Jerusalem, they fail. Um, and these are the most learned. These are people that do have plaques on the wall. These are people that all they wanted, it seemed, was to do the right thing. And the more they worked at it, the further away from the truth they got. It's just one of the weird ironies about being here. I see that all the time. See that within my own work. I'm working on, a, on learning to, you know, the quest for the great mix, the quest for the great music, you know, to share that music with people, the quest to, to, to do it better, to do to f further. And then I find... Sometimes the more I get engaged in working and it becomes a somewhat of a vanity, the further away from the goal I get. It's only when I approach it with reckless abandon of like a child having fun and giving all the glory to Yahweh, it's only then that my endeavor goes good. When it's so important, you know. Oh, and among musicians, it's just a terrible, terrible, um, terrible peer pressure to conform to their whatever, their bubble-headed BS that, they, that they're that they somehow important. <laughs> I went through this with actors. You know, now, now I'm dealing with this with... Uh... No, I mean, they have to wear a certain kind of tennis shoe and a certain T-shirt and a certain, you know, certain piercings and, and they have to have sleeve tats and, you know, then they're really official, you know, or something. I, it's just, it's hard to, hard to take seriously. But, you know, it's just like every... Everything else, life to me is like a big circus. And I love it, you know. Don't get me wrong, I love it. But I'm not going to fall into, you know, you have to be a certain thing or look a certain thing. or I just eschew all that. Or if someone comes to me and says, there's a big drama. I'm like, okay, I think I'll just disappear for a couple of days, come back. Ah, what happened to the drama? Ah. Yeah, see? Everyone wants to latch on to some kind of conflict, you know, like, like, okay, the political thing. Well, I don't care about the political thing anymore. I cared about it for a while, and I saw that, you know, what it really is. And um, I don't, you know, to me, politicians are not the most important people. They don't deserve my attention all day long. I mean, I, I mention Obama just because he's, you know, he thinks he's a rock star, so... He's subject to uh, the critique, but I mean, he's not any different than anybody else. They're all like that. He's just a more a better example. 
of, uh, you know, to what in God's eyes would be a f- complete failure. You know, I mean, it's just a, a total, a, 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 a colossal. But in the world's eyes, um, at least half of them anyway, he'd be a great leader. You know, and the same thing with Ceausescu, the same thing with Mussolini, the same, same thing with Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin or Mao Zedong or Pol Pot or um, Pinochet or any of these other people. They always had a certain amount of support and people thought they were like gods on earth. You know, I don't understand. Or, you know, the guy that just left, for God knows where, Hugo Chavez and his um, penny ante crap of stealing $2 billion from the people from the oil business for his own private uh, family use while shafting all the people with a terrible economy. I mean, the commies are just simply selfish capital. They're capitalist pigs is what they are. They are capitalists for themselves, but not for the people. Punish the people, take the money for yourself. That's all communism is. I don't see why it's so, such a mystery to people that when you have commies in the government, you're going to get this result. I think that there's only, obviously one thing to do is make communism illegal in America. That's the only way you're ever going to get the country, but it's not, not going to happen because people are too stupid here. People here have an IQ of 50. We went through that. Once you become part of the hive, you take the shortcut. Your IQ is cut down to 50. I know I gave it, I, I had it at 80 at one point. Now I think it's really more like 50. In other words, the hive will do your thinking for you, so you don't need to process in your own brain. Because it's like the birds. When the birds decide to fly left or right, you have a whole flock. It's because they're, they're a hive, they're linked. So each one of their brains is very small, but together they have a big brain. Together it's the all-seeing eye, the pyramid and the all-seeing eye. They don't need to have a high IQ. That's why when you talk to them individually, they're so stupid. They can't put two sentences together. But then when they're in their hive, they can be brilliant as lawyers and doctors and you know, as long as they're connected. Because the data, the processor is the group, not the individual anymore. Therefore, their muscles atrophy. And that's, I've answered so many questions. Is there anything else? <laughs> Have you had fun with me? Did you like my stories? I'm so grateful to the Lord to remember those stories. I, I cherish those stories, you know when I come to think of them and I thought of them today and I thought I'm going to share it with you because I realize, gosh, you know, those might help somebody else, but I mean, I'm so glad that I went through that. I'm so glad. Oh, I had another teacher. I'll tell you about that one later, but he was in the, in the school of religion and he just, it was just a struggle. He just, he would not give me an A on a paper, even though I was you know, researching, it was in, in, the, in the field of religion, which was my major. And I just, you know, oh, I just, you know, and finally, finally had to give me an A on a paper, but he just kept knocking me down. Then my final grade was like, you know, I had like a perfect average, like a 4.0, okay? I was not a stupid guy. And, um, and then, but this was the one class I had an A minus, an A minus. And he goes, well, you got four A minuses and one A, so that means you're an A minus. And you know what? That was the best thing that ever happened to me. That knocked me off my vanity high horse. That humbled me. And even though you might say, A minus, that's not bad. It's like, no, for me, I was in this perfection thing where I wanted to have a perfect 4.0. Now I'm going to be 3.9999, whatever. But I, I would never, that 4.0 was tarnished. It, it had to have, I mean, it was ridiculous that I was, you know, hold, but, you know that was helping me at my self-esteem. But, I mean, I was already didn't even know who I was at that point. You know, I had no idea who was there in the classroom. But when I got knocked off that, it was, um, again, a great thing. When they didn't read my play, that was a great thing. When I realized later they were deserving of better, that was a good thing. You see, all those things, I mean, and, and it's worse. I mean, you know, being, you know, there's bad things that happen too, where, you know, there's physical damage and harm and, incarceration, all kinds of things that occur that are not fair. But remembering these incidents, in other words, I became aware at 18 years old that there was definitely a, in college, there was definitely a, you know, the two groups of people. And I've known this one guy, he kept getting an A and A and A and A. It was like, he didn't even do much, you know. But that wasn't the point. The point was, 
there was this game going on, and I became very aware of that at that time. And, you know, then I realized these gatekeepers, whether it's in the audition in Hollywood for, the, for, for drumming, um, whether it's um, in school, don't matter where it is, the people of the world, the worlders, uh, you know, they have their way of doing things. And one is to punish success and uplift the group of mediocrity. In other words, mediocrity is going to win, but true success or true genius will be, uh, we will break that person. There's that attitude. Like they say in Japan, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. The guy that's got the great innovative idea for cars, that guy Tucker, oh, they just hammered him down. The guy that's got the free energy thing where we could all be blessed and save billions and trillions of dollars that could go on uh, infrastructure and uh, making all our lives better. Oh, they, they're hammered down as a kook. All the good things and the cure for cancer and everything hammered down. You see? That's why I don't hold the world in esteem. The world may hate me because of Christ is why. There's no need... If there wasn't Christ, then there'd be no need to even acknowledge me for any reason, even, even put out the energy of hatred. But the world will reject everyone that's not with it. Even if you merit much better, and, or even because you do, all the more need to get the hammers and tongs out. You know, and that's just, it's just a, an obvious thing, and... Um, there is never going to be an argument about it. The only reason that you have a place, a voice, a job, whatever you have, it's all because the Almighty Lord giving that to you. Because God knows they didn't. They've given you nothing ever except a kick in the teeth. And you've overcome them. Further to that, amazingly, miraculously, you forgave them all. Because Jesus forgave us, we forgive them. Because we are in him, he is in us as one. There's no need to hold a grudge. We don't want anything they have. We're just taught to, when we're kids, we're all taught to compete and run after that brass ring. Then you realize it's corrupt. And then don't stop believing. How can you believe Steve Perry when you know all that stuff? When you see it the way it is, there's no believing anymore. You've got to find a song to sing. But it's not that one. That's for the deluded world. They think they're going to get somewhere. Yeah, I remember my mother kept saying how she was getting better and going to the doctors and getting her tune up. And, and boy, life was just getting better and better and better and better. And it was like, no, she was dying of cancer and it was getting worse and worse. But she kept telling herself that to keep herself going. I suppose that worked to a certain extent. But that's kind of like it is. The patient's dying and they keep telling them, keep, don't stop believing. They keep giving themselves a reason to believe, to go on when they know it's a sinking ship. It's not going to work. If you're in that category, you get on your knees right now to Jesus Christ. That's your God. That's your Father. That's your life. That's your way. That's your truth. That's the only thing that's going to save you. And if you feel like I just said, then you're not with the world. You're a prodigal. Get on your knees. Get on your face. Surrender to Jesus. Who spilled blood paid for you anyway. Since you can't earn it. Obviously, he's now choosing you through this podcast. So accept him. And live. You're a duckling, not a... You, you know, you're not a duckling. You're a swan. So swim and fly with the swans okay yeah, don't worry you can get all the facts It'll, yeah, I think you know the story you see legally if you didn't have the spilled blood of God if the lamb of God was not slain you'd have no chance legally there'd be no, no there's a legal thing here that God you know fixed his righteousness not your, but, but you're on your way to that. In other words, you're, you are the lamb, ultimately. That's a mystery at this point, but that's the new Jerusalem. I mean, there's a purpose to having gone through this. And of course, 
you know, paying for the sins of the world means you have a way to disconnect. Those of you who did take the shortcut, you still have a way, if you can hear this, if you're not too far gone, you still have a way to God because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of the spilled blood of God, because of the sangre de Cristo, because of that, you have a legal avenue to eternity. But I know, oh, I'm talking to, you're probably a little bit older, and now the world's not doing you any favors because, see, when you get old, they push you under the bus too, don't they? That's fine. God, God knew you'd come in at some point, so come on in. It's open to everybody. Really, really anyone who can hear this message, I mean, I don't know exactly what the distribution is. I do know that there are, you know, are ducks and swans. I do know that. I know there's sheep and goats. The Bible tells me that. I know there's wheat and tares. I know there's light and dark. I know there's fallen angels and and holy angels. I know that there's I know that, that that whole thing exists. I also know that God did it all from the end from the beginning so that everything you're going to do is already scripted. And you will do exactly what the script says. You will not fail. So today is your day to wake up. Let's call this your birthday. They also call it your the Beatles song your birthday just as what song that what that's about? That's about the day you get initiated into Satan. Where you, you where you're publicly baptized. That's as far as I'll go with it because it's too ugly to describe. <laughs> too disgusting. But basically, that's the day of your emancipation. The day you get out of jail, they'll call it. Your birthday. And on your birthday, they want you to dance with the devil. And dance you shall. But if, you know, once the devil throws you under the bus, like he just did, yeah, you got nothing to lose. I mean, you know, in a way, you can't expect yourself to be some big time saint because a lot of these other guys have, you know, when it was really hard, when it was like they were going to be completely, you know, not be able to get anywhere in the world except hurt, they accepted the Lord and stayed the course. And I know you didn't, but... You know, it's, it, it's not like Satanism. You don't earn your way up to the higher. There is no hierarchy. You are equally brethren to me if you're in Christ. There is no higher or lower. We share all knowledge via the Holy Spirit, amen? So we, between us, we, there's no above or below. We're just there. That's the, that's the way the new Jerusalem will be. Is there anything else, my lord, that I should impart to the, to the beloved brethren? Anything at all? I guess that's about it, folks. I don't know where all this comes from. I, I just am always amazed, like you, that I, it just doesn't stop. It just, it just rolls out like a scroll. It just, it's amazing. And, you know, nobody promotes any of these things. Nobody does anything. It's just uploaded as a podcast in, in some obscure part of the cyber universe that nobody bothers with. And yet the words of Jesus, he sent us into the world, didn't he? I ask, I don't think I would come here, you know, and then I look at John 17 and he goes, oh, we were born into the world because he sent us into the world. He sent us before we were born. That's why I'm here. Okay, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yeshua. Okay, I get it. Now I understand. It's not about me. Never was. It's about you. Thank you. So I don't have any purpose of being, you know, whatever. The great this or that or the great Oz. There's no... Need. It's about you. Now, whatever happens, whatever there is, whatever title, whatever not title, whether I abase, whether I abound, whether I do this, whether it doesn't matter. In Christ, that's the main pinnacle. The rest of it is just incidental. Groovy, baby. That means I don't have to have a big pressure on my back. Of, I mean, I do have a thing of wanting to put out the best quality I can put out in terms of you know, music. I do want to 
understand the path of mixers that went, you know, and producers that went before me that mixed and engineers that went before and how they did what they did. Because it's fun, but I've got to keep it in that context of it's not that important, though. You just walk away. But if I'm shown... Because a lot of times I'll be stuck in a mix and I'll go, Lord, I just can't do this. And he'll show me, so he's helping me. You know, he'll help me to cut through, you know, years of apprenticeship that didn't happen because I'm kind of self-taught. And so he'll, he'll teach me the things the, that they're doing, you know. And, and then I'm grateful, but then people say, how'd you know that? And it's like, I, d- I don't know anything. You know, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just let's, let's let this be a witness that God has the mixing board. And look, when you go with him, look at, look at what happens. You have beautiful music that comes out. And so, yeah, and, I, and there's no accidents. All the musicians around me, oh, I might as well make this announcement. Okay, I was going to leave, but okay, since it's had that. I'm, we have um, two studio projects under, now we are Carova Media. That's C-A-R-O-V-A. Just getting started. And um, just getting started. And I'm, no, oh, you're too old to have a business. I'm like, ah, I can't help myself. And two studio projects ongoing. One, Sword and Dove, which you, you've got to buy it at Reverb. Now, I got mine from Reverb. Now, I ordered 20. I want someone to order 100 you know, or more. From, give that guy out in Van Nuys who's, making, who's replicating these CDs. You know, they freak out. They're not used to having huge volumes. So give them something to really worry about. You know, you'll eventually get your CDs. Um, but um, definitely it's a great CD. Definitely, it's a, it's a, it, that was my first effort as a, as a real producer, you know. And, uh, I mean, as, you know, with gear and with the, you know, with help from a uh, Grammy Award winning uh, producer and a guy building the studio, you know, it's my first, you know, effort. And it's just, you know, it's maybe not perfect, but I just, it just sounds so good. You got to have that record. You need it in CD form so you can see our pictures and there's a little, di- you know, a little written word in there. And it's like... You know, twelve ninety nine versus nine ninety nine. I mean, don't do the download. Get the CD, and then you can make, you can convert to MP three after that, or buy both. The other project is called Death Camp Parade, which is a a, t- a term I coined, just thinking about, you know, back to the death camps of Nazi Germany. So about how how the people that really survived were those who were celebrating and doing you know, what Wormbrand was talking about. They were singing and clanking their, their chains as instruments. It's people that were doing stuff like, you know, in other words, throwing a parade in a death camp. That was, that's the kind of thing that would make people survive. So Death Camp Parade. And the first album is coming fast and furiously. It's just, that's where I've been. We've been in the studio. We've been tracking. We've been mixing. We've been doing it all. Uh, and buried, and there's just so many loose ends because we're telling a story about the future. There's a concept album about the future where the world is run by, yes, machines. In other words, almost like what we're talking about now, but it's in the future. Humanity is kept in camps unless they escape, and then the, the whole drama takes place in this place called Sector 133, kind of like the Hunger Games where the people go there to... Um, fight it out for the entertainment of the machines, which are metahumans. They're beautiful cyborgs. And they just are eternal and they're lovely. They're more beautiful than any human. You know, they're just the ultimate in beauty. But they're machines. They're not real. But they rule things. And they have their elite pleasures. And then it turns out that they're raging perverts. And <laughs> I can't even say some of the things that uh, we've talked about in story conferences, but there's one thing where they have these perverse habits with sex and uh, they're really disgusting. I mean, beyond anything that's... <laughs> beyond... Uh, anyway, it's, I'm not going to say it to you. I, in fact, I don't even think I could say it in the music. I've just got to figure out a way around, you know, to kind of say it symbolically. But there's some, you know, these, these beautiful creatures, you can't even imagine them being that, being so ugly. And then there's some other twists and turns. But the humans, when they finally learn in Sector 133, they finally learn that instead of killing each other, they should unite. You know, and I know that's another Hunger Games. Theme, but, but there's lots of novels being written in that same theme and lots of sci-fi going way back with a similar theme, even Planet of the Apes to a certain extent. So 
they start to unite. And the, 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 the metahumans and their civilization, they have these beautiful cities and they have advanced technology where they, they throw like lightning bolts at, you know, like there's trees and rocks with little surveillance things. So if you go by and you're not the right person, it just fires a lightning bolt at you and vaporizes you. You know, there's that danger. But then the humans learn to fool that machinery. I don't know. Maybe it should be a movie too. But anyway, that's the project. And um, we have maybe an, an EP that we've done. We have a couple of songs that we did preview of early Death Camp Parade, which had to do with chemtrails and, and the gun grab. Um, or, you know, martial law, DHS, all that. But those were just kind of like very terrestrial. I mean, they were really good indicators that were kind of going in the right direction. But uh, um, it's cool, man. It's, uh, I won't go into any more than that. But do buy the, do me a favor, okay? And buy as many Sword and Dove CDs as you can. So that can help in, you know, getting the next one done. Because we're all the same musicians are working. And to keep them working, we have to you know, be able to pay them and money comes from the CD sales. So please honor, the, if, if they, they blessed you, which I can't, you know, Sword and Dove is really Kelly's music, Kelly's voice was my production. It's a, it's a joint effort. But, you know, I can't imagine you finding a more pure-hearted singer. Those of you who really want music from the Lord, I don't know. You know, you might find, you know, all kinds of, musicianship and high productions and stuff, but I don't think you're going to find anything more pure to the Lord than that. I don't think so. I haven't heard anything. I judge by every time I cry. The music makes me cry, even though I'm, I mean, I've been in there for hundreds and thousands of hours working on it. Still, still I put it on, I, I, tears come to my eyes. Oh, that doesn't happen with the world's Christian music. <laughs> I make that division. That's terrible, but... Uh, yeah, there is kind of that division, you know. There's the Babylon Christian and there's the, there's the, we're not even really Christians. We're just, we're in Christ, but I mean, we're just, the whole album is really dedicated toward uh, healing. Sword and Dove 1. And we want to do a Sword and Dove 2, which is kind of underway a little bit with the 50 Billion Star song, which was a freebie we gave you. But I mean, uh, we're going to move on from that. But I mean, that was, there was an indication that, hey, production quality and, Everything is uh, increasing. And, you know, we think that uh, that also is a, an amazing song. It really soars. So do that, and I will see you next time. Blessings to each and every one. Praying for you constantly. We love you. And I will see you next time.